All right, welcome back to the Two Stewards Show, or welcome to the Two Stewards Show. If this is your first time listening, this is where Mark and Brent discuss, that's me, Brent, uh, discuss real estate investing, money, stewardship, and more uh, from a Christian perspective. And we've been going through a little series on tenant screening. Last time we talked about uh, long-term tenant screening, so people are staying for longer than a year. And that's uh, one process to kind of go through uh, who you want to get in your unit. And today we want to talk about uh, Mark's speciality, which is specialty, specialty, short-term tenant screening, because you're the Airbnb Meister, Maestro. <laughs> Man, I <laughs> botched that intro. Room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so we all, because we've all heard uh, stories, I think, of people having bad guests, you know, mm. guy wants to just rent his place out and go away for a weekend and he gets somebody in and completely trash the place. And then they call Mark up and say, Mark, what did I do wrong? And so we want to pick your brain, figure out how can we avoid having bad tenants when we're dealing with Airbnb short-term rentals? What do Absolutely. I do? And the good news is it's not that hard to do actually. As long as you pay a little bit of attention and are a little bit conscientious, um, it is very easy to avoid uh, 99% of the bad bad guests. Okay. So. And that's good. We're, we're recording audio and video this time? I mean, <laughs> we'll see at the end. <laughs> oh, man. This is the third time we've talked about this. So ah, We should really know yeah. our stuff. Uh, now. We got all <laughs> things figured out. Anyways, so thanks for tuning in. Um, what's the first step? when we're talking about Airbnb screening, tenant screening. Okay, so they're... Not, not tenants, they're guests. Guests, yes. Guest, host, not landlord, tenant. Okay. Different mindset, right? And why do you say Hospita that? Well, it's a hospitality mindset. Okay. As opposed to just uh, a sort of a providing a service or providing a thing, providing a place to live. So important to remember that when you're dealing with, uh, with guests. And if you can't handle that kind of... Um, commitment then you shouldn't be in short-term rentals either right so it's it's like you know sort of like running a hotel it's not right. exactly the same but it's the same kind of response you would ex response response you would expect from like someone at the front desk of a hotel if you ask them a question kind of the same idea with uh, responding to your airbnb guests or right. short-term rental guests so i should say if we're saying airbnb in general that really means short-term rentals yeah. Not just the air. And we define Airbnb. short term as less than 30 days, less space. than 30 days. Yeah. Anything above that is kind of in the midterm area. So yeah, there's a, there's a few steps and like the last step is actually screening the guest on the short term rental platform. And that's where most people start. Uh, and that's part of the reason why they run into problems. So there's a bunch of steps before that. We talked about with the long term rentals, um, you know, buying the right kind of house makes right. such a big difference in uh, in your investment and in the kind of tenants that you can attract. Yeah. Um, you know, with the the idea that you want to attract good, good tenants who have a lot of income so they can spend a lot of money on the housing without overburdening themselves. And so it's the same kind of idea with short-term rentals. So we get a mix of people that we see in our business um, some, you know, maybe half are looking for a place to run a short-term rental because they like the idea. And then like the other they've heard, um, uh, they've heard that, you know, it's a good investment to buy a house. And so how am I going to rent it out? I'd like to try Airbnb. I'm yeah. looking for a house that might be suitable for Airbnb. What do I look for? Yeah. And they're asking you that question. Yeah. Especially in, in today's interest rate climate, um, where long-term rentals, like if it's just a straight, like a, a, a non-duplexed house, yeah. um, you're going to have a very hard time cash flowing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with a duplex, you'll probably do better. But, um, yeah, if you that's causing people to look at different styles of rentals, right? So short and midterm are, are yeah. two of those. So, like I said, probably half the people that we get are looking for uh, a house yeah. or a, a property. And then the other half already have one, but they're looking at making, up a, making a change. Right. from long-term rentals sometimes they're switching from uh, a different property manager as well so but. the people who basically the people who already have a property um 
they're going to get different advice than the ones who are looking. Cause if you're looking, you can already try and find a property in the right area and you guys can advise on that. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, tell absolutely. us what you got to know. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of it boils down to, I just um, give Mark an opportunity to talk and away he goes. <laughs> yeah. You can leave now, Brent. I'll, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll handle uh, this. <laughs> you got some paperwork to do. <clears throat> no. So, I mean, we, we will generally sit down with new clients and just get an idea as to what their goals are. Yeah. Right. That's sort of the first step is, you know, what are your goals in general? Like, do you want to retire at 35 or yeah. is this a longer term thing? Like, what are you looking at getting from this property? Are you going to hold this property for a long time? Yeah. Is this going to be a short term investment, like short term rental and a short term investment? Yeah. Right. All these things kind of determine the approach that you're going to take. Um, and then once we figure that out, figure out like, you know, what, what are you comfortable doing? What kind of guests are you comfortable hosting? And, uh, you know, so if, if they are, if they have a family, for example, they may want to be, they may be interested in hosting families. So that right. means you're going to need a certain, at least a three bedroom place, right? Maybe more. And you're going to set it up for families. And so this is when we talk about your ideal guest. Uh, it's also known as your avatar in, uh, in in the industry. So when you're figuring out your avatar, you set up the place to attract that person or that group of people. And then if people outside of that subset book your place, that's fine. That's great too, because you're going to get that maybe 25% of the time. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to get the place that's going to attract that avatar and then set up the place with the amenities that, that will make them happy and make them want to hopefully come back as well, if possible. If that's the kind of uh, rental that you have where people can, will come back year, uh, year after year. So um, just finding the right house or the right property uh, is, is going to be a big difference. So, and like, well, okay. I so <laughs> how do you find the right house? Like uh, I'm just looking around and I, well, that looks like a great house. Like <laughs> what criteria, like, should I already have in my mind, like, I do want to rent to families. This is going to be a long-term investment property for me. I'm going to own this. Mm -hmm. um, like, what sort of things should I avoid or what, what sort of things am I looking for? Um, yeah, so we, we always want to have, you know, whether we're investing personally or, or doing it with a client, you want to have a plan B Yeah, maybe a plan C. So if you're just doing like you're, you you want to do a strict vacation rental, so that could be a cottage in the Muskokas, for example, um, that's going to limit you to as to the choices that you can make in the future, right? It still could be very lucrative, right? Yeah. People who have them who do very well. Um, and, you know, if you know that's an investment property, maybe you want to go up there once in a while, but... The problem with that is, you know, the times that you want to go up there is when everybody else wants to go there as well. So it's not the best time for you to go because you're losing out on revenue. Um, yeah. So kind of balance that out. But yeah, if it's a strict vacation rental, then, you know, you still want to do a little bit of research to see like, you know, as far as the size goes, are we going to attract families? Are we going to attract large groups? Is it going to be a smaller, more intimate place? Um Will the rates that we can charge for that smaller place justify, like, can it pay the mortgage? So you have to, you know, have a pro forma, do, run the numbers and make sure that uh, that it makes sense. But again, with va strict vacation rentals, that's a little more cut and dry, generally. You, yeah. know your, you know your target audience, you know your avatar. If you're looking at something more urban, which, um, which is really where Airbnb came into its own, right? Vacation rentals have always existed in uh, in a lot of different markets, um, like for ages, right? There's been cottages, there's been cabins um, all over the place that people could go to and, uh, you know, take their families for a vacation. Uh, what Airbnb did is it kind of brought that concept into cities, right? It started out with a couple guys in their apartment renting out air mattresses in their living room for people for a tech conference uh, in San Francisco. All the hotels were full. They thought, hey, maybe we can make some extra money. And to their surprise, like it got booked instantly. And then they just kept doing it and then figured out, hey, we got something here and, and kind of expanded that uh, the whole platform. And um, yeah, it's it's gone worldwide, right? It's in 
I can't remember now, but hundreds and hundreds of cities across the world and uh, pretty well every country. So uh, something like six, between, well, it depends on who you believe, but between four and six million hosts across the world wow. and millions and millions of uh, stays every year. So it's, yeah, it's been pretty popular. So again, they, they just took that, that concept of a short-term rental and brought it into uh, urban areas. Right. And yeah. today, Airbnbs will be, they can be strict vacation rentals because a lot of those traditional vacation rental markets are now a little more formalized and structured and they're on a platform like Airbnb or VRBO or Booking.com. Um, but, you know, they always existed. But the difference is in cities now, you have options for short stays as well. So you need to figure out if you're in a city, what happens if the market for short-term rentals um, goes badly? And it has, right? COVID, we saw that in certain markets, uh, especially vacation rentals, they did very well because people weren't traveling far. So they would find something local where they could take a vacation. Yeah. So a great boom for, um, for the cottages and cabins. Um, but then, you know, urban markets didn't do as well in general because... People weren't traveling and doing all the other things that would cause them yeah. to go to an urban market. So you want to have a plan B or maybe a plan C where if short-term rentals fail, what can you do? So for a lot of our clients, that answer is mid-term rentals. And we do uh, usually a mix where it's short-term rentals in the high season. So typically summer with a little bit of spring and fall in there. And in the winter, we'll switch to more of a mid-term uh, stay uh, style which is 30 days or longer. And that's a whole different group of people that you target. All right, but, we'll talk um, about that in the future. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we will. But that, so that's an option, right? Or um, regulation is, is one of the biggest risks. If you're doing risk analysis for a short-term rental, that's your biggest risk factor, right? Is, is there regulation now? Is there going to be in the future? Because if there's not now, there probably will be. A lot of cities are cracking down, try, excuse me, trying to limit yeah. short-term rentals. And um, so, and typically the language of those bylaws states 28, 29 days. So anything yeah, see, over that. You let Mark talk and he just goes off about some risk factors and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it all, but it does have to do with, Avatars. with getting, getting Tenants, the ideal okay, guest in yeah. there and screening, making sure that the person that you want in your unit is, is the there right and the people one. that yeah. you don't want uh, don't even think about coming to your place right it doesn't pop up on their yeah. radar and yeah. okay so what but, so what are um, the sort of things that you can do then um in terms of selecting a house or selecting a property to well let, let me just let me right just track. go off a little bit more on the right, my, my tangent <laughs> <laughs> that i was on because if you have let's say a very plan, important <laughs> a plan b of it's important to me brent okay when are we going to talk about but think me? about the audience <laughs> and the listeners their time is valuable mark <laughs> yeah, i guess um if you have a plan b or a plan c then you have to actually plan for that as well yeah so you have to plan for the type of guests that you're going to get for midterm rentals and if that doesn't work like maybe it's just not a suitable market. Yeah. Can you do a long-term rental? Yeah. And if you can, then what kind of tenants are you going to attract to that place as a long-term rental? So it's a lot to think about, but you're, yeah. you're sort of doing, uh, thinking about screening your guests or tenants yeah. when you're getting that property. So before you even made the selection of the property, yeah. you've already screened all the tenants. Yeah. And so, you know, does it, can I have good guests from all three rental styles? Would yeah. I be able to attract them? Yeah. And so generally, you know, if you get a good house in a good neighborhood or maybe a, a, a poor house in a good neighborhood that you can fix up, then that answers most of those questions positively yeah. because you, you know you're going to get good uh, guests anyway. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, whereas, you know, if you buy, let's say, a luxury property, right? So a, a mini mansion or something like that. Um, there's a potential for high returns in a short, short-term short rental style. Yeah. But if things go south... Uh, what else can you do? Yeah. It's going to be much harder to find midterm guests and, and certainly long-term guests. Yeah. And then also if you need to sell, because that could be your plan D maybe, like we just, we sell the property. 
Um, a property like that is going to be much harder to sell. It's going to sit on the market for much longer because there's a smaller pool of uh, buyers. Whereas that starter home in a good neighborhood, everybody, like, you're going to have a lot of buyers. For yeah. That. So just, yeah, so a few things to think about. So assuming you've got the right property, that's sort of step one. Then um, step two, yeah, what's step two? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're you're the expert. We've defined an avatar of guests that we want to track, and we bought a property. I'm assuming you have to furnish it, or um, you have to make a listing at some point, right? Yeah, that's right. So setting it up would be the next step. I think I'm the expert. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you want to set it up with that avatar in mind. So again, if it's families, then you want to make sure you've got stuff for children of different age ranges, right? So yeah. that means like you know plates and <laughs> the uh, plastic ikea plates and cups yeah usually. and this is a lot different than long term right because uh, yeah. the traditional kind of uh, straightforward landlord tenant board um, we're going to get a tenant in like we're not providing any of these uh like generally speaking you're not providing furniture or cutlery or dishes or any of that sort of stuff um, maybe in some instances you're giving like um, like student rentals for example you're giving them yeah. like a bed and a desk um, but generally speaking, they're just going to show up with their own furniture. And so in, in, with Airbnb or short term, like you, you basically have to create an experience or, um, you know, write down, I guess you can create a, a, an experience right down to the cutlery and just say like, you know, every kind of aspect of this thing is tailored for my avatar that I want to yeah. attract. Um, yeah. and I guess if you kind of deviate from that, then you're going to might, might start attracting people you don't want or. Yeah, or, or you get bad reviews from your guests. But like you mentioned, student rentals, that's a perfect example because you're trying to get students into that house. So you're going to provide usually a single or a double bed yeah, um, and a desk in those rooms because that's exactly what students want and need. Yeah, You don't have to worry about the rest of the stuff. Maybe you got a ratty old couch in the living room. Yeah, or TV a, on the wall. Yeah, TV, like the things that you know those... Because you're not trying to attract a family. You're yeah. not trying to attract fam you know, uh, short-term travelers. So that's like that's a good example of setting it up in case people aren't, can't really understand what I'm, I'm saying, of setting up your unit to attract for the people that you kind of want in there. Yeah. Right? And even long-term rentals, um, yeah, there's things that you can do, right? Like uh, you could have... Um, an island, for example, where people are going to eat at. So at an island, that might be room for two, three, four people. So Like this is in your kitchen, not like in your private lake. Yeah, exactly. So if it's a family that you're, you're trying to attract families to your long-term rental, you need a more formal or a bigger dining room with a bigger table. If you're looking for young urban professionals who are kind of going to be there for two years yeah, and they're eating in front of their laptop up. as they're working yeah, on their they're new business eat at so that island yeah. so that's that's another example of you know attracting the ideal uh, ideal guest and the more you can attract your ideal guest the idea is the fewer problems that you will have yeah. with those guests so that's all part of the screening process so yeah once you set up your short-term rental getting back to that um you're gonna have you know if it's again families you're gonna have furniture that's maybe a little more durable so that kids can jump on the couch because you know they're going to do it, right? <laughs> no matter how much I'm not at going. home. I can jump on the couch, Dad. <laughs> um, you know, you may have some board games or video I'm games. I'm going to send my kids over to your Airbnb for a bit. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't target families. <laughs> you can jump all you want on this couch or this bed. Well, it's funny, but you do have to assume people are going to do the worst things you can imagine yeah. to everything that you have. Right. So you budget then... to replace the beds or the, the couches every... Yeah, yeah. I think, I don't know if we've done a, have we done an episode on that? But yeah, you have to, when you're setting up your unit, you got to budget for for replacing, you know, All like linens stuff. would be the biggest one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Linens every six months probably. But yeah, if you got a couch, two years. Yeah. Right. And beds, maybe it's three done. years. Yeah. Um, so you kind of amortize that over your, uh, your end when you're building your pricing, yeah. have that in mind. You need that reserve fund to replace furniture. Anyways, that's a little bit, yeah. uh, a, little <clears throat> bit a little bit out there. But yeah, you, you, you're you going to set up the unit to attract that ideal guest because the more of that ideal guest that you get, generally the better it's going to go. So in the example of families, 
usually you don't have a lot of problems with families other than they might be a little bit messier than other guests because of the kids and sometimes things get broken because of the kids but as long as you're okay with that um they're generally not partying they're not being super loud other yeah than the kids being loud but like once the kids get into bed then uh, then it's quiet so um you know good relations with the neighbors and so forth so yeah you set up that unit to it for your for your ideal um guest and that that's the the furniture the decor you know if you've got like we have some places that are just one single bedrooms um and you know in that case you're going to do probably a at least a double maybe a queen bed the decor can be a little bit um yeah, maybe a little more contemporary or edgier because we know we're getting like younger guests mainly in for short stays. So it could be something that's, you know, Instagram worthy. Whereas with families, you're not as worried about that, you know, other than yeah. maybe like the views are Instagram worthy or yeah. or the pool is or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's sort of your next step. You, you get the right place. Uh, you set it up, the decor and so forth. Um and then the next step would be pricing. Okay. And a lot of people would be like, um, oh, we should probably hit the cameras there. Um, the, the next, yeah, pricing, like what does that have to do with screening? But it has a lot to do with screening. Again, you're trying to attract that ideal guest that you want. Um, and what you don't want is, uh, is lousy guests. So rule of thumb which is, you know, it's a very crude rule, but like uh, cheaper rates, cheaper guests. And, you know, we talked about that a little bit in the long-term um, tenant screening The more you charge, episode. the better quality the tenant is? Yeah, generally speaking. And that, you know, that sounds horribly, uh, like that really shallow, but it's like, it's just, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a little bit jaded from past experiences. What kind of stories you got for us? <laughs> Um, <laughs> lots, Wait, you, but, so you posted units for cheap and you got people that you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, um, you know, we're generally, we're looking for people with a little bit more disposable income who are going to behave, yeah. uh, reasonably yeah, and not damage. The yeah. Unit. Not damage, like take care of the place. <clears throat> well, cause when I think about tenant screening for short term, like with long term, the consequences of that decision when you when you screen a tenant, like you could have them for life or what, like whatever, yeah. until they're they want to move out, right? Yep. But with short term, like generally, you're um, you know you're there for whatever your stay is, right? And maybe you have to request for a longer stay or something, and it can bump out a bit. But yeah. like the consequences aren't like lifelong. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't but, know, but you could still have a lot of damage, right? Because you have a lot of furniture in there. You have a lot of other things that we don't don't have with long term. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So, and and you have to be constantly turning that unit over in order to to make money with it, right? So, anytime something interrupts that process, like you got to fix stuff, and they're there for like a you've lost uh, all the money on that stay because they've broken more than the value of their stay. Yeah. Um, or even just more than the value of whatever your your percentage number was for that, your profit percentage was for that stay. Yeah. And then maybe you've got to cancel the next guest because stuff's broken, right? It just really yeah. messes up your monthly cash flow. And then you got to pay for all the broken stuff. Yeah. And you probably have uh, some sort of implication when you when you cancel them that your, your yeah. ratings or whatever goes down. And yeah, you never want to cancel a guest on right. Airbnb. So that's... Um, that's bad. So yeah, there's all kinds of bad stuff happens when, when but pricing it. So you're saying pricing is a good mechanism to start filtering people out yeah. right up front and say yeah. like, you know, if you can't achieve this price, then it's not the unit for you. Yeah. And that's essentially, that's what we're doing with all the steps that we've talked about buying the place, uh, like finding the right place. You're fil you're automatically filtering out certain level of guests, uh, by doing that, buy the place that you buy. Right. And again, with long term, we talked about it. If you buy that lousy house in a lousy part of town, you're going to get lousy tenants, generally speaking, um, and you're going to always be stuck with them. You don't have a way out of that, really. And uh, the same same logic applies for short term rentals. So we want um, yeah, we want guests with um, with a little more to lose as well. Right. Maybe that's just a bad review on Airbnb, but maybe they like to use that platform. 
And now if they can't use it or nobody's going to rent to them, that would really, you know, that, that sucks for them because yeah. they want to use that. So there's there's that sort of threat of, um, of bad reviews or, you know, maybe they've, there's a credit card on file so they could have to pay for damages as well. So you want people for whom that's not even really an option, right? Like if your kid breaks something, like that happens, you deal with it. Um, but I'm talking about people who are partying and, you know. Intentionally causing damage and, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. A ruckus in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You don't want a ruckus. No. Um, so yeah, we try and weed them out. Uh, and so yeah, with your pricing, that is another mechanism to do that. And there's a few, a few things to think about when you're talking about pricing. Um, yeah, with with guest, yeah, guest screening and just having guests in general, right? Um, when you have a, let's say you have two identical listings, one is worth 150 bucks a night, or is charging 150 bucks a night, the other is charging 200. There's the issue of perceived value, right? Right. You know, us being cheap and Dutch probably uh, <laughs> would choose the hundred and fifty dollar a night one. All things being equal, but yeah. most people will actually, or a good percentage of people will gravitate towards that two hundred dollar a night thing. Yeah, because it must be better, even though they're identical, the same bedroom, same yep. finishes, Could be the exact whatever. same place <clears throat> in a building, right? Two, two units side by side or two houses in a subdivision that the same builder built. Right. Um, and we see, like, actually see that all the time with Airbnb. So part of the difference could be amenities. Got, yeah, but there's got to be a, a limit to that too. Well, no? there, like, there is to, a limit. So. You have to be reasonable. But um, people want to, people have confirmation bias, right? Where they want to, uh, they're looking for confirmation for their decisions, so if they were to book that two hundred dollar a night place, it, it should be better than that other place just because it's it costs more. And then if they have a good experience there, that just confirms their bias that they made the right choice in paying two hundred dollars a night because everything worked out well and it was good. Yeah. And they you know, the the brain wants that that happy, happy vibe, like <laughs> you did good, Brent. Yeah, you I know, made a good, good decision. Job. Okay. <laughs> right. Now if if they realize that the unit's not up to snuff, it's not clean, or it goes the other way. are missing. Yeah, then then you're setting yourself up for trouble. So make sure that it's everything in your power to do is done. That the unit yeah. is very clean. That you have the amenities that you should, and that it at least compares to that other place, right? And then the other thing to think about too is that if if you know occupancy rates in your market. Um, and if you know where everything's going to get booked, all the decent rentals are going to get booked, then you might as well price it higher. Right. Because it may get booked later than the, the one at 150 bucks a night, but it will get booked. So you're saying basically like if, if I'm in a certain area, let's say we're in Hamilton. So let's say in Hamilton and I know that like, uh, I guess summer's the busy time. Yep. So summer, everything's getting get booked up. I'm, I'm like, okay. Uh, yeah, I post my unit up and it's not getting booked because, well, maybe the price is too high. I should lower the price. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you do and you get booked and then you realize that all the other ones are double the price. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. so how does that impact? So I basically in that situation, I should not lower the price. No. That's what you're saying. No, you shouldn't. Um, and you have to be comfortable with that. But you, then you need to know occupancy rates in your market and yeah. you need to know pacing. So pacing is like when things get booked and, and your seasonality as well. So there's tools for that, like AirDNA can help um, to figure out what those numbers are for your market. But if you know that... AirDNA is just like a website with yeah. metrics about Airbnb. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Um, so if you know that 100% of the listings... 100% of the good listings in your area are going to get booked, um, then you just have to wait, right? If you know that from the data. And you know you're a good listing. Yeah. Okay. Then, then uh, like, you may not get booked two weeks out. Maybe it's a week out or maybe it's three days yeah. out uh, <laughs> till you get booked. <laughs> but See if that? you know yeah. that, and that's that's the hardest thing for people. I know who are that's new so stressful. Rentals, it's like right? if I if I'm not if I have this valuable asset, I've put in all my money and and then I've furnished it and I've done all this work and I 
I built this whole system to clean it and everything. And I post it up and I don't have money for three days from now. And it's like, ah, I got to lower the price. And <laughs> yeah, that is the hardest part for new folks get getting it. And the, the biggest thing we see all the time, right? People's yeah. immediate reaction is I got to drop the price. It's like, no, yeah. just wait. Just wait. Um, and so for us, looking over just our listen portfolio. Just listen to Mark's calming, soothing voice. That's right. Just wait, just. folks. <laughs> should do a recording and put it on one of those yeah. uh, night lights or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Be patient. The, the money um, will come. <laughs> but no, we will, like, we'll look over our portfolio and, like, you know, different listings will have different uh, pacing. But if I'm seeing that a particular listing is getting booked up a lot in advance i know something's wrong i don't want that right some people would be happy right if a month in advance <laughs> their unit's fully booked for me i know that's not good maybe right. i want 50 percent booked a month ahead and you kind of get that 50 percent based on what the area yeah. occupancy or... yeah exactly so you need to kind of know your numbers but i know um like that's too much and what the reason for that is i'm priced too low Right. right. Some people are going to make their plans um, a month or two in advance, and that depends on the listing as well. Uh, but some people will book in advance like all the time, and that's fine. Right. Other people are like um, me, and they're like, tomorrow I'm going here exactly. and I need a place. <laughs> so if I know the demand in the market, then. Um, and usually it's like the busiest time because there's some event and now I'm paying 10 times as much because Mark's sitting there going, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I, like I will take some of the bookings far in advance yeah. and I'll keep my prices up and if people want to pay that, great. But then I don't want, let's say there's, you know, I don't want the other 50% of people who are going to book a month in advance because they're looking for much lower rates. Right. I will take the people who will book close not maybe not last minute but like within a week or three days or something i'll take them because they're willing to pay the higher prices yeah and that means at the end of the month i've gotten higher prices all the way around right so and one of the and presumably you've dealt with people that you want to deal with yeah like this is the tenant screening part of it where you set your pricing right not only do you get the prices you want but you're not getting the tenants that yeah you want to avoid yeah and i'm getting people who are happy to pay those rates and as long as they're happy with the stay, then they're going to leave me a good review. Right. Right. That's the other part of it is you need those good reviews in order to keep going. That's your life. And it's love. just, it's a, yeah, it's a self-fulfilling cycle. So if you're getting bad reviews and you're doing poorly, you're going to like cycle down. But <laughs> if you're like... getting good reviews and you're doing well, you're going to move up. And that moves you up in the um, Airbnb algorithm which means you rank higher. So when someone's searching for a place, maybe your place is on the first page to pop up, which where most people are going to not go past the first page. Yeah. Right. So it's a whole, um, a whole cycle that if you do it well, then you get those guests that you want. They're happy to pay the rates that you want. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you, you do well so mm. that you can continue to invest in the place and make it better. So, and I will say we use pricing software, Right, because managing a bunch of units um, and figuring out all the different events and everything that are going on in the city and like seasonality and even just like intra week demand, right? What week or which day of the week is the most is the busiest, right? Like do, one person can't do that, even a team of yeah. people. It's hard to do, especially if you have one over here and then you have another one over there. Yeah, different neighborhoods. Like the minute somebody has. Well, one is one thing, right? If, especially if it's in your own house or like, you know, right down in your neighborhood, you can manage it. But if you yeah. get two in different neighborhoods and you're yeah. into a whole different, yeah, culture around that, that unit. and Yeah, and uh, the, the conventional wisdom around that is that people who aren't using pricing software are probably down like 25% from people that are. Okay. And, uh, like I've seen it. You set your ranges for what you want to charge. And yeah, sometimes it could be double, triple, quadruple of what you would normally charge. And you would never think to charge that. And maybe it's like Great Cup weekend or something like that, right? Um, that's a big and event. That, actually, that's a good example. Yeah. Because that's we, a big event for all those American <laughs> listeners. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's the Great Cup, Mark? <laughs> football. It's like Canadian it's like football. the Super Bowl. Or <laughs> it's like your local high school. Uh, <laughs> you probably get more people at the high school games. Who am I kidding? 
Um, <laughs> no, no, that's but, a big deal. <laughs> no, but that is a good example because we started getting yeah. a bunch of bookings for units like November 17th or the, the you know, three days around there or three day minimum. Um, and I'm like, you like the first one, like, oh, whatever. No, it's pretty far out. We normally don't book that far Like out. this year, you mean? This year, yeah. So we're in June now? Yeah. Well, this was like May we started wow. seeing them, right? And I'm just like, oh, that's weird. But then I got another one. I'm like, huh. And then another request for one, I think. I'm like, what is going on? Right? And two people were requesting the same place. So I'm like, did your... I messaged. I'm like, did your husband... Because I noticed it was a couple. Both yeah. were couples. I'm like, did your husband also request... She's like, no, no, it's Grey Cup weekend. I'm like, oh. And then I looked at the pricing because I had not reviewed pricing that far out. Yeah. And sure enough, it was like the pricing software had bumped it up significantly for that weekend. So, And you, you I had to sit to back. And, and, okay, so yeah, you were in a situation where like, me. well, actually, it's double the rent. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there, it was at least <laughs> See, double, if not more. I think that's something that's totally different than uh, long-term yeah, I mean, totally different, but yeah, it's not like seasonal and, you know, intra week. <laughs> like, by the way, <laughs> if you want to live here this week, you got to pay more. <laughs> Maybe we should. I mean, give it a try. <laughs> but, um, and it, yeah, we're getting a little bit, a little bit off the, uh, off track here, but like suffice it to say that pricing properly, um, will also get you the kind of tenants that you yeah. want. Okay. So good. You buy the right thing, you, you furnished it, you got it up there, you price it right, you're attracting your avatar, and they're starting to message you, like, what can you do now? Or, yeah. like, what, what's the next thing? Yeah, so, and I, I should add, in, you know, in all of that, like, you're talking, you we talk about setting up the listing and having, you know, the right pictures and doing all that stuff. Well, I think we've done that in a previous episode, um, but that's all sort of in that vein of attracting the right tenant. So once you're at that point though, and people are starting to, um, to book your place, there are a few settings that you can uh, set as well to eliminate most of your problems. And in general, you can eliminate 80 to 90% of the, the problem, problematic uh, guests by doing the stuff that we've talked about um, and like the pre-filtering and what we're going to talk about right now. Oh, right. right That's now. the most of it. So the, the, we have sort of a, a rule of three no's that we talk about. So that's no. And, and this is a big deal. Yeah, this so is a I big should deal. Listen to this. Yes. You should write this down. Brent. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so we don't allow these three things to happen in conjunction with each other. Sometimes one at a time, but not all together. So, um, no last minute bookings, yeah. like day of, no local guests, and no one night stays. And the most important of that of those is uh, the one night stays. We, I th- we might have one property property um, that we manage and the, the owner, he wants the one night stays and as an option. Yeah, and just to fill because, you know, you'll get increased uh, occupancy if you're filling in between other um, other stays. But in general, we don't allow it. Um, so, and if you just think about it, right? If somebody lives, and we'll use Hamilton as an example, because we're in Hamilton. If somebody lives in Hamilton and they want to book a place for one night, um, for tonight, and it's like five o'clock at night, like what, what do they want? What's yeah. going on? It's usually uh, one of a small number of things, right? It's a party. Yeah. That's the most common one, right? And especially like weekends. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a party or someone's looking for somewhere to do drugs or prostitution. Right. And uh, like we don't want any of that stuff in our houses. Yeah. Criminal. Yeah. Criminal, criminal activity. activity. Yeah. Yeah. We just like we don't want to contribute to that scene. And we like just from our perspective, we don't want it because we know stuff's probably going to get dirty or broken, yeah. and um, the not neighbors gonna are not going to be happy with. Yeah, ne- exactly. Neighbors aren't aren't going to be happy, and that's um, we should talk about neighbors quickly. It fits into all of this somehow, but um, <laughs> <laughs> generally, we will when we we get a new listing, we'll go talk to all the neighbors. Yeah, and uh, we'll just let them know, like, hey, my name's Mark. Um, we're going to be, you know, managing the property next to you. It's going to be short-term rental, 
Yeah. And I know sometimes people have concerns about that, but um, I just want to let you know we're going to take care of the place. We don't allow one night stays. We don't allow parties. Um, we want, and you know, look at the neighborhood, kind of figure out your like what your avatar is and who lives in the neighborhood. But like, we want families in here for an yeah, as an yeah. example, right? Um, and uh, try and allay their concerns a little bit. And you want them to call you rather than call the city or the police if there's an issue. And you know, we'll kind of frame that as well. Like, hey, you know, it would, you'd be doing me a really big favor if. Some, if you notice something was amiss, just yeah. please call me. So you don't have yeah. to say, like, I don't want complaints just to the city. Just not at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, I would rather get a call from a neighbor at 4 in the morning than, than the from police. the police. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, pick your poison, I guess. Yeah. But um, just frame it like you're doing me a favor if something's wrong and you would call me so that I can take care of it right away. And then yeah. you have to take care of stuff right away if it does happen. But, um, you know, that Have that you had you. stuff happen like that? Or? Very rare. <clears throat> Excuse me. Very rarely. Yeah. Mostly it's just neighbors being a little bit oversensitive. Right. And that is sort of, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because now once they know they have your number. And they know they, they can, can call you for like, you know, there's a cigarette butt on my lawn. Or, <laughs> you know, they're out there talking and it's 1030. And like, you know, they can talk on the porch. They can't yell and scream. Yeah. Right. So then, you, you know, you may message the guests and say, hey, just please keep it down or yeah. whatever. Right. Um, just so we, we've had a lot. Just of look that. at each other. Don't yeah. talk. <laughs> <laughs> look deep into each other's eyes. <laughs> um, you know, but we have won over neighbors as well to right. the point where they've actually uh, booked our place. With your charm. Family. With, yeah, my charm, my roguish charm and my uh, stunning soothing, good looks. And your soothing voice. Yeah. All, all three. It's a killer combination. Yeah. Hire Mark. <laughs> Hire Mark. For... <laughs> but so you're saying the neighbors will actually book your place. So that seems like it's a local thing, no? Like you said, no local, no last well, minute. Well, they'll no like book minute. it for family coming okay. into town and a little bit of advance yeah. notice, right? Okay. And husband uh, was mad at the wife. Or <laughs> yeah. Wife is mad at the husband. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We haven't had that, but yeah, it could okay. be either the dog house <laughs> or my house. So. <laughs> Um, anyways, that's just a quick little note on, uh, on, on getting to know the neighbors and make sure they're on your side, right? You want them to help you instead of to hurt you. Yeah. So, but the other one, so, uh, one night, okay. Yep. That makes sense. Um, local and last minute. Yeah. Um, like a last minute to me strikes me as like, an, it could be emergency or something like that. <clears throat> but so you're saying you don't want all three at the same time. Yeah. I, I or, generally don't want any of the three. As soon as these come up, it's a red flag. Yeah. Like if I'm if my pricing is is proper, I should be booked. You'll have nights where you're not, and that's just how it is. So, you could be available for that last minute booking, but then you can set parameters within Airbnb or your other booking platforms to not allow an instant booking. So generally, we right. allow our guests to book instantly, so they can see the place if they like it. They book uh, without consulting us. Yeah, we just get a notification that we got a booking, uh, and that. You know, the advantage to that is um, you get a little bit more of the impulse buy. Uh, we're, and like once people have booked it, then they're kind of locked in. But instead of allowing people to think about it or look at other places, yeah. they're going to book yours right away. And it also ranks you higher on Airbnb. Okay. Right? They give you better, um, better preference if uh, people can book your place instantly. Because that's what the Airbnb wants as well, is they want people to be to able book. to like... Yeah, they want yeah. bookings, yeah. right? So make it the easiest possible for people to uh, to book your place. Um, but you can set it so that if somebody is under age, for ex like under, I can't remember, 25 or 21, uh, if they don't have reviews on Airbnb, um, a bunch of these different things that, or you can just say like, like they're uh, not verified or yeah, they're not verified the platform. Or yeah, something. or if the booking is for the same day. Um, then you can say don't allow instant booking in these cases. Right. right. So in that instance, like Airbnb, the platform or whatever other program you're using does a lot of the verification up front for the for you, right? Like Yeah. Like the the, the so I'm thinking with long term tenants, I'm doing like employment check. Uh, or like a, some sort of source of income, right? I'm yep. doing a reference check. 
um, yeah, we get identification. You can do a background check or like all these different things that you kind of take upon yourself as a landlord of a long-term tenant to find out, um, cause you're entering into a long-term relationship, but, um, like you don't actually end up looking at their information. You're letting Airbnb platform do that yeah. for you to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the vast, uh, majority of time. So Airbnb does some, um, probably a better job than other platforms of doing some verification. So if you were to sign up for Airbnb now, you would have to um, provide uh, like a driver's license or a passport, sometimes both. Um, and then also a credit card for, for booking. Um, and then they will sometimes do some kind of background checks as well. I don't know exactly how they do that. Uh, but I have heard of people being either hosts or guests, not being able to book or to list their property. Um, cause they're a bad person. Cause they're a bad person. <laughs> Wasn't you Mark, was it? <laughs> <laughs> not yet. They haven't found out about me yet. Okay. Um, but they do, yeah, they do, uh, a, a little bit of screening anyway. So, right. and, and for us, that seems to be enough, right? The fact that people have had to, you know, upload their ID, um, yeah, but a bit of their information, they've got a credit card on file there that eliminates most of the bad actors out there. Right. And if then, you can get a credit card. Yeah, that's like, you know, a lot of people can get credit cards, but there's also a lot of people who can't. Yeah. And those are, you know, they've either lost their credit cards or they just don't qualify and probably not the folks that you want staying at your place yeah. anyway. So that's just another sort of barrier to entry. Um, and then the rest you have to kind of do on the platform. So... That would be some of the, like the three no's that we talked about. And then some of the instant booking stuff where the, <clears throat> you know, they can just submit a request to book, right? So if they want to book tonight and it's already like five o'clock at night, well, they can send a request for me to book and then I'll just like grill them. Like, why do you want to come here? What's yeah. your story? You can ask whatever you want. Really. Yeah. And if you see they live in the same town or the same city as yeah. the unit, then you can ask them. Like, yeah, and, and you're looking for a one night stay. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can either decline or just like kind of string it along a little bit. And yeah. um, and there's no penalties if you decline a pre approve or a, just a request to book. Okay. Right. If you cancel, that's terrible. Um, but if, if it's a request and you decline, then that's you're okay on the platform. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you just have to make sure the story kind of lines up. Yeah. basically and that you trust so, it and if it doesn't you decline and like with uh with long term we're governed by the landlord tenant board um we have a lease so the see you later mark <laughs> so the so the tenant comes in and he's like once we give him the keys give him the money he's going to be our our tenant and uh, or sorry he gives us the money we sign a lease agreement we're governed by the landlord tenant board so if something happens um we have to go uh, and go through this whole process with landlord tenant board to try and get them out or figure out our problems with short term rentals. You're not governed by the landlord tenant board. No. So what are you governed by? Um, the rules of, uh, like it's a commercial lease. Okay. So the rules that apply to that, <clears throat> which are much more, um, I guess, landlord friendly Yeah. or, uh, in this case host, but yeah, so if you have an issue, you need to make... So if you have somebody renting your place as a short-term rental, you need to have a contract of some kind. Yeah. So, excuse me, the Airbnb uh, agreement is generally enough uh, to show like a police officer, for example, right? If you're doing a direct booking, then you would need to have some evidence of an agreement, uh, whatever form that is, if you use like a, sh a short-term lease or whatever but you need to have that agreement to show that this is not yeah. a long and direct release. booking means like they just reached out to you, Mark yeah. and said, Hey, I want to rent your house for three nights. And it wasn't on Airbnb. And you just said, okay, so yeah, you need exactly. to make your own contract for that situation. Yeah. So just anybody listening, it's important to, you know, if you have somebody staying for three nights or something and it's like someone, you know, or like friend of the family or whatever, um, like get that thing signed. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, if it's your brother or something, maybe not, but yeah. unless um, he's a criminal. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it depends <laughs> on your brother, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, always have that, that thing signed so that you can prove to generally the police yeah. that this is like, this has nothing to do with landlord tenant board. 
Um, so it's out of their head and like, yeah, it's a commercial lease and I have the, like these people are trespassing on right. my place. They right. were invited guests. Now I don't want them there. And that has nothing to do with whether they paid or, or not. Like, um, it's just, if you're trespassing on this property, get out, whether you've paid to be there or not, you can sort that out as a civil matter right. as far as the police are concerned. But yeah, you just need to show them the documentation that, uh, it's not a landlord tenant board thing. And then you're, you're, um, hmm. I mean, I haven't had to do it, but this is based on things that I have, uh, seen. I have had to remove a guest, but I just say, physically, well, with your leather jacket on your big beard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> My leather pants. Uh, <laughs> they just up. walked up the road and they, they started running. <laughs> Whoa. Who's that guy? <laughs> No, we had, uh, and so this is, you know, where we get those the three no's. Like, this was earlier on in our Airbnb career. Yeah. We would just rent uh, any time to anybody. And, um, yeah, it was a fellow who booked the place for his daughter who was, he was trying to detox. Oh. Um, and I'm like, you know. But and, they didn't disclose that. No, he didn't say that, right? Yeah. And then, uh, and it was actually in our house, so we kind of could see this firsthand, like just lots of weird stuff going on to the point where like, yeah, the, I think uh, the they're like, oh, the toilet's not working. I'm like, it was working. Yeah. So I had to actually pull the toilet and there was like a shampoo bottle stuffed down the toilet, right? And I know it wasn't there before. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, you know, this is like the last thing. Yeah. You got to leave. Yeah. This is not the place to do what you're trying to do here. Yeah. Right. Felt bad for the guy, but uh, at the same time, this is my yeah. house where my kids are in. Yeah. And, um, but in that case, I just asked them to leave and, you know, they're a little bit of back and forth. It didn't but, escalate uh, to, it uh, didn't escalate and they yeah. left. So, um, you know, hopefully you never get to that point. And again, that's because we didn't abide by those. We didn't have the rules at that point, but we didn't abide by it. Right. If we had, we never would have rented to this, uh, person and never would have had that problem. So yeah. most of your problems you can, um, you eliminate upfront by not even having that person apply or try to apply to get into your property. Yeah. So. Ooh. Okay. So is there anything else in terms of tenant screening for short term specifically um, before we jump into another episode about midterm tenants? Uh, there's maybe one thing I should touch on. Which is a bit of a bit of an issue, um, and it's around pets. No, oh. so we allow pets in most of our properties for a couple of reasons. Number one, a lot of people don't allow pets. Maybe a quarter of listings will allow them. Yeah, and you know you got to make sure it's set up with not a lot of carpet, um, so that the cleaning is a lot easier. Um, but also, some people will bring like a service dog. Yeah. And, you know, it's bigger in the States, but you can't legally discriminate there. If someone says they have a service animal, then you have to allow it in there. And that for a while, that was even like an emotional support animal. I think the rules have changed a little bit on that now. Um, and especially with Airbnb, you can deny, I think, an emotional support animal. But it's just like a whole bunch of back and forth and whatever. So yeah. we've never had issues really with people and their pets. Yeah. Um, right. We, you lay out some rules, like if your pet damages something, we're going to expect you to pay for it. Yeah. And you need to clean up and, and all that stuff. Um, but some people are totally against having pets in their properties. Yeah. So just, you know, if you're doing that, be aware that people are going to try and sneak pets in. And then you got to kind of deal with that. And afterwards. there's nothing you can do about that or? Um, no, you can. Like you can add cleaning fees and we'll do that sometimes uh, with some properties where we don't really want pets. We'll allow them, but we'll just charge them an additional fee for it because it's extra cleaning. Like if we know there's more carpet and stuff. And that's like, a case by case. Like if somebody says, hey, could I take my pet? And yeah. you said, okay, well, it'll be an extra yeah. or whatever. So that is sort of a little bit of tenant screening there. Yeah. Um, so you got to make that decision. Do you want pets or not? And some owners are absolutely against it. And others will talk to them and be like, look, it's just going to be more revenue and uh, should be better for you. So um, that's something else to think about when you're setting up the unit, right? Because yeah. a lot more people are traveling with pets uh, since COVID even, we've noticed. Um, so it's, yeah, it's another consideration. I recommend doing it. 
and uh, just you know pricing appropriately and, and setting up the unit appropriately as well. Yeah, and making sure so. that you're cleaning in between properly so you're getting good reviews. At the end of the day, like the reviews are kind of your lifeblood. Yeah, and cleaning is the most uh, the most important part of a review. A, a review. review. People who get bad reviews generally it's because of cleaning. Right. So make sure you're clean. All right. So thanks for listening. Next time we'll jump into uh, midterm rentals, midterm mm-hmm. tenant screening, which is a kind of a interesting segment of the market. Um, there's some cool opportunities there for investors. Uh, short term obviously has its pros and cons, long term as well, and midterm's uh, an interesting little market. That's Mark's another it's the expert. Goldilocks. In there. Goldilocks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just right. So with that, thanks for listening. Until next time, steward your wealth wisely. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Two Stewards Show. If you like my voice better, click subscribe. And if you like my voice better, click share. If you like both, give us a five-star rating. To interact with the show, feel free to reach out at hello at twostewards.ca. We'll see you in the next episode. In the meantime, steward your wealth wisely.